Tell them what time it is. Little hand says it's time to rock and roll. All you people are so scared of me. Come quietly or there will be trouble. Man, that's just me. I'm Batman. This is Sparta! There is a tiger in the bathroom. I'm an excellent driver. If it bleeds, we can kill it. Pop quiz, hot shot. Keep the change, you filthy animal. I have a message for President Snow. You can torture us and bomb us and burn our districts to the ground. But do you see that? Fire is catching. And if we burn, you burn with us. Hello and welcome to this week's Monday Movie Show on 24th of November. We're, we are a month away from Christmas. Unreal, isn't it? No, one month, one day. Yeah, one month, well, one month and, you know, three hours. Well, if, what, one, month and, <laughs> what, one month and one day if you go American-wise. I don't think it's like 20 days in total. Mm, yeah, but still, it's a month of Christmas. Whoopee. Is it not crazy? I mean... Yeah, but to think in that month, we'll probably have somewhere in the region of about six shows. <laughs> Because we'll have a few normal shows, then we've got our award show, and then instead of doing the last show would be a normal show, instead that'll be um, a Star Wars special. And you know what, as well, the thing that's interesting, um, there are films coming out, not this, not just this week, but next week, that I have seen a couple of them, and I think some of them may make appearances in the awards at the end of the year. And that's only coming up just now, you know, so we're still no. getting good films coming out. So it, it's just, yeah, the, this is when we got into overdrive because we have to work out what our films of the year are <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. But that that week, when we do our award show, a normal show, and the Star Wars show, we'll be doing three shows in the space of around about eight days. <laughs> no, it'll it's be less than that. Be, it's going to be less than that, isn't it? It's, it's, it's going to be like going four be, days well, or something. Well, the way I've worked it out in my brain, we have a normal show on the Monday. We'll do a Star Wars special probably on the Saturday and Sunday with the film being out on Thursday. And then we'll have a award show on the Tuesday, which will be just before Christmas this year rather than uh, yeah, last year where we had a normal <laughs> show on the Monday and the award show on the Wednesday. And we had the Christmas week off. We're not doing that this year because we can't, thanks to Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can. We just do Star Wars early. <laughs> just yeah, well, as we'll, soon as it's on. We we'll yeah. can't unless somebody decides to be nice, like JJ Abrams, if you're listening, invite us to the world premiere, and then uh, we can I'm, review it earlier. But we're I getting, don't think he's listening. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I neither do I. But we're we're getting um, Saxon and hopefully Mark from following the nerd on on the shore as well. So. I, I think I should get like a few puzzles ready or on my tablet ready because I know I'm not going to be involved in that show that much. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, let's get on with the show. We got, as usual, uh, quite a bit coming up. Some movie news, um, a look at some new releases, including these ones in the cinema section. Yeah, the final entry into the Hunger Games series with Mockingjay Part Two and a very quirky dark comedy drama with the dressmaker. Yep, um, and then of course we'll um, also have a look at the UK box office top 10 and in the DVD and Blu-ray section we'll be going through these movies. Uh, Disney Pixar's latest DVD Blu-ray film, because their latest movie The Good Dinosaur is out on Friday with Inside Out, boxing drama, South Park, comedy sequel with Ted 2, Arnold Schwarzenegger goes up against zombies in Maggie and buddy cop comedy Hot Pursuit. Yep, um, and again, also in DVD and Blu-ray, we'll be going through the UK combined top ten, which has a couple of surprises in it this week. I wasn't expecting when I had a look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's you on the site, Monday Movie Show, UK. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but before that, first of all, as usual, um, some movie news, starting off with... The, the, not really so, so much surprising, kind of knew it was coming... Um, bit of news that 20th Century Fox has removed its Fantastic Four sequel from its upcoming schedule. It was uh, scheduled to be sometime in 2017. It's no longer in the schedule at all. Um, it's not a surprise really after Josh Trank's uh, adaptation of the Marvel comic um, has been a su- successfully fantastic flop. Um, taking only about $56 million in the US on a budget of around about $120 million. 
at least the only thing that he can be proud of is, is the fact that it's not going to be the biggest flop of the year by the looks of things that'll be Tomorrowland I'm kind of disappointed by that because I'm annoyed because it that resulted in Tron 3 essentially being ditched and I really wanted I really wanted Tron 3 I really really wanted a Tron 3 okay hmm. good for you well throw a hissy fit towards Disney saying you really 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 want a Tron 3 well I'm hoping I'm hoping if Star Wars does really really well because obviously now that's Disney they might reconsider they might think you know what we've done really well with Star Wars chip off a little bit of that throw it to the side here have you know 100 million go and do Tron 3 do it on a restricted budget no there are directors out there who could do a Tron 3 on a budget of around about 50 60 million so maybe give it give it to those intelligent directors who know how to spend a budget properly rather than use it on stupid things that's not needed for a film Hmm. Uh, other piece of news I've got is kind of it's two in one um, it's all surrounding uh, Vin Diesel has made some announcements and, and to do with a couple of his franchises uh, first of all the Fast and Furious franchise is looking at possibly having spin-offs uh, there is going to be this uh, sort of another trilogy they're looking at finishing off with Fast and Furious at the moment um, but then there's talk of there being a spin-off nothing's been confirmed yet nothing's been written down or anything no pen to paper or anything but fan speculation is that it will be following The Rock Dwayne Johnson's character Hobbs okay hmm? fine good yeah I wouldn't be surprised if they go spin-off territory for the yeah. Fast and Furious stuff I wouldn't have a problem with that because I, I actually like the character and it's a good character that you know it would be a it would be a, a slight different twist to the whole thing, but it would be still in that universe. Uh, the other bit of uh, connection with Vin Diesel is regarding the character of Riddick, um, which is a character I do love, but I've got to admit, the last film really was a letdown. Um, and there's talk that he's going to be still doing another Riddick sequel, um, and a spin off TV series will be. In, is in planning to happen um, following uh, mercenaries set in the Riddick universe and uh, supposedly David Tui the man who created Riddick and the universe and has, has written and directed all of the Riddick films is supposedly involved at some point in some yeah, way he's, he's supposedly writing busy right now we're on um, the fourth Riddick film at this moment and supposedly churning in the, the script for that one um, next month and uh, the, the first draft of the script so we'll see what turns out with that mm. um, it needs to go back to its original roots because it, it's a series that attempted to try and do something different with each one of the films whereas with the, the third film it tried to meld both ri- um, Pitch Black and the Chronicles of Riddick together and it failed to do that because it, it didn't get what Pitch Black was like and it shouldn't have got what the Chronicles of Riddick was like because that film is terrible so they, they try to meld both of those two together in field. So I think it should go back to its dark, dark roots of the of Pitch Black. Mm. If it needs to succeed the fourth one. I remember. But how many people care? I do. I actually, I want one. Just not the same. I don't want another rehash of Pitch Black. I want them to do something different again. Which is what I liked about Riddick. Is what I liked. Oh, sorry, what I liked about Pitch Black. I liked about the Chronicles of Riddick. It did the different thing. And I like that. It's it's nice to have a sequel that's not just a complete rehash of the second one. <laughs> Two. Uh, sorry. Excuse me. Yeah, but the, the, the thing is, so Pitch Black was an interesting concept which worked for Pitch Black. Mm-hmm. When they tried to expand on it, it, when they tried to expand on the character, he wasn't interesting enough for them to actually do that. So he, he's got a decent backstory. But he, it, it, they didn't make him interesting enough at all for them to be able to expand on it. More so into two films, into two games, and into an animated feature as well. Hmm. So it, it, it just didn't it didn't work because they just didn't have very much to play with. And when they added more stuff to it, it just failed. So hmm. they, they made it try to make it into an action film when it was in fact a science fiction horror movie. Yep. So what have you got there, newswise? Um. It's what bloody disgusting is actually uh, reporting at the moment uh, because Universal Pictures are absolutely steamrolling ahead with all of their monster revival series. Uh, they tried that with Dracula and told, and unfortunately for them, it, it failed a little bit. And so um, early earlier on in the month, there was talk that Scarlett Johansson was um, tapped to be the lead role in the reboot of Creature from the Black Lagoon. And so at the middle of last week 
a rumour surfaced where Angelina Jolie has been asked to play the Bride of Frankenstein in the remake of Bride, and Fra Bride of Frankenstein. Now, it looks like they've approached Tom Cruise to star in the reboot of The Mummy. Okay. Hmm. It's an unusual choice. I wouldn't have actually thought to go for him for that. The thing I'm thinking about, because I've finally seen the trailer now for um, uh, Victor Frankenstein. I'm wondering, is that going to be part of this? Is this the whole? Is that part of the shared universe? Is going to be? Is this going to be connected with Dracula? Because it does have that look to it. It has the same kind of feel to it. So, are they doing this shared universe thing still? With there's not really been much development on this, has there? Yeah, there hasn't. But by the looks of things, I think they realised they were burned badly by Dracula when told. So they need to actually tread careful, carefully with with what they actually do. And do you think? That the best thing for them to do is to get huge massive stars to star in the film so it, it, it's just that's not the answer that is not the answer just because you are a famous film star doesn't mean that you can make a successful film it, it's not the answer you need a more solid script you need a more solid director to be able to carry the film the, this and then direct the star um, with the character itself it doesn't matter who plays dracula it doesn't matter who plays the mummy doesn't matter who plays the Bride of Frankenstein. You just need the, the competent director there, and you need the competent script. So throwing money into um, huge stars like Tom Cruise and Scarlett Johansson and Angelina Jolie is not the answer. Mm. I, I agree. I mean, it's, it's the, thing of, the thing is, you've got to say with Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise has become, because he's heavily into producing as well now, He it's basically if there's something that he's interested in doing, he will push to get it made himself. He will do it. He, he'll, he, I mean, he's he got... The last Mission Impossible film made essentially. He 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 is the, his his produ production company that got it all sorted out. He got Jack Reacher made and is getting the second Jack Reacher made. Um, I suspect as part of a deal with Paramount of the, you know, you star in our Mission Impossible films, we'll fund your Jack Reacher projects, sort of thing. Um, and it's it's the thing that he's got that kind of pull with the audience, and so therefore that pull with the studios. Yeah, um, other news, according to Variety, Christ Christopher McQuarrie will return to write and direct the next Mission Impossible film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think they've got a, a fairly good work working relationship after having done Jack Reacher and The Last Mission Impossible, um, that it's just sort of teaming up again makes sense, and I think Paramount are happy with The Last Mission Impossible with, um, uh, not Ghost Protocol, um, Rogue Nation that they'll go, yep, fine enough, have them back. Although, I would prefer Brad Bird. Of course, now, Paramount may balk at the idea of having Brad Bird direct a film of theirs that's going to be a franchise thing like this after the failure that was Tomorrowland. Yeah, um, the first trailer for the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles will be attached to the new Star Wars film. Isn't this the second trailer that's being announced to be connected with it? There's something else. I saw something. I can't remember what it was well, now the other day. Well, you know studios are going to try their hardest to jump on to try and attach their trailer to the Star Wars film because the amount of people that are going to go and see Star Wars anyway in, in the US, um, it's predict the prediction that the Star Wars movie, next Star Wars movie is going to take in its opium weekend is around about $190 million. It's already gone through $50 million in pre-seals. Mm. Which, um, if it does get around about $190 million, that's not breaking box office records. Because that belongs to Jurassic World, taking $207 million in its opening weekend in the US. Um, and so it will not break records if that's the case. That's what predictions are aiming at. So if you, are, if you have got a big movie coming out from uh, uh, pretty much in 2016 and you've got a trailer already, you want to attach yourself onto Star Wars because you know... A ton of people are going to go and see it. Yeah, I mean, I've I've got tickets for a midnight showing when it's released with friends, and I was looking around and everything out of curiosity, talking with someone today about it. There, uh, there are around Glasgow several cinemas, obviously, um, and one of them, the one centrally in Glasgow, um, is showing six screenings of it, uh, six separate screenings on at midnight. They are all already booked out, completely sold out. The one I'm seeing it in isn't actually directly in Glasgow. It's near there, and it's it's. I'm seeing it as one of four showings, and two of them, one of which is a humongous size theatre screen, and I don't know how many seats. It's got to be in the hundreds seats. Um, that's completely sold out as well. So, and this we're a month away still 
and they're you know completely sold out already for the midnight ones and for a lot of them on the evening of the day of release so it's basically a sellout performance for the entire first day i think pretty much yeah well i'm not going to see it on the midnight launch there's nowhere in hell i'll actually be able to do that because the fact that it's on for two and a half hours and i've got work the next morning so by the time i get home it'll be like three o'clock in the morning i have to be up at seven so i especially my job i can't survive on four hours sleep so that's not possible at all um i'll probably be going i'm going to see it on the night uh, of release uh, my cinema isn't luckily sold out of tickets yet and i'm only going to see it in 2d neither i'm not going to see it in in 3d i'm hoping that's um uh that Stuart in the live chat there he says he'll be watching star wars in the first week of release if you want to hear an interesting conversation about star wars listen to the latest horror show from from Stuart with uh, from page to screen and i go off on a bit of a rant about star wars but that's a completely different thing um couple of other pieces of news i'll end off on a bit of a, a guh kind of news but uh, the new tomb raider film has found its director after Catherine bigelow passed on the project raw utaug will now helm the project you know you probably haven't a clue who the hell he is no i don't and i'm quite disappointed to hear Catherine bigelow's leaving it although i kind of think if she'd done it it would have kind of been a bit oh she's going back doing the the girl character because because Catherine bigelow as a woman director isn't known for directing female things i mean obviously zero dot 30 had jessica chastain as the main protagonist and the female to- female protagonist but she's not known for that so i kind of would like to see her do that but i think there'd be a lot of people that would have kind of they would have had it in for her if she'd done tomb raider yeah and um with Stuart being in the uh, the live chat there i wonder if he actually knows who raw utag is because it's horror related so I, I doubt he will but um for people who don't know who he is, he did um, a very, very good old-style slasher movie called, called Priya of Fritz Wild, which had um, a sequel, and he was always meant to come back to do a prequel to it, and I really want to see um, a third entry in the, the Fritz Wild uh, trilogy, because I really love those movies. It reminded me of um, Scream. It's, set, it's a typical kids in a um, cabin in the woods being stalked by a killer, but it's actually, it feels like watching Scream for the first time. And so they are really good films, and so they've got a really interest in their director in Raw Tag. Um, the last piece of news, and this is silly, but uh, John Malkovich's new film from direct, director Robert Rodriguez, titled 100 Years, has been given a release date. I mean, well, fine, we're, we report all the time on release dates of films. Yeah, this film's coming out on no- November the 18th, 2115. Uh, that's the silly part the film is not coming out for another hundred years it actually has got a release date of november the 18th 2115 the reason why is because the company that's funded the movie is um a liquor company and it will be celebrating it's a new liquor company and they'll be celebrating their 100th anniversary in 2115 and you want this film to be the thing that celebrates their anniversary Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think we should just move on to the UK box office. Top yeah. 10. Number 10 is a new entry for the perfect guy. Uh, yeah, this is one we didn't see. I was going to try and see this week, but I didn't manage to. Um, it is a surprise that it's in the top 10, considering it didn't have a big widespread release, a lot of films do. Um, but it's this kind of um, sort of thriller, stalker. Um, sort of movie that I mean uh, it looks as if it's very generic can't say that it is or not because we haven't seen it but it doesn't look like anything special it does look like a very small release um, so it's probably maybe doing better than you would expect but I don't expect it to be around next week especially just going at 10 and only having I mean it was in 102 sites the rest of the films apart from the next one um, are so, sort of 200 up at least yeah, and before I get on to the next one, just one quick uh, note, which um, if this film's not in the top ten, but if you go onto the, the website, mondaymovieshow.co.uk, you can see a little rundown of the chart and a bit of a note that I put in there of a film that we were sub- maybe is going to review this week, which was um, Momentum. Um, it was released in ten sites, <laughs> and it took £46, <laughs> with an average uh, taking of £4.60 per site. <laughs> yeah, this is um, a film which got James Purefoy and Olga Kurilenko in it. It's um, a South African-funded thriller, 
which is out on DVD and Blu-ray in January, but it is now becoming one of the biggest flops of the year at the UK box office. Not the biggest flop. I can't remember what that film is. Um, as a matter of fact, it's the fifth lowest taken for a film this year, so it shows you... Does the other one have Danny Dyer in it? Less than £46. Does the other one have Danny Dyer in it, by any chance? I don't think he's actually <laughs> released a film this year in the cinema. I know he was in a couple of movies that went straight to DVD, like um, Assassins, but mm. I don't think he released a, a film this year. But yeah, um, £46 for the film Momentum. I, I'm sure if he has released anything in the cinema this year, Stuart will know in chat, he'll tell us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, like I said, I think it's Assassin, and I think that was direct to DVD, um, and the rest he's just been concentrating on his role in EastEnders. Um, at number nine is Bollywood film Prem Ratan Dan Payo. We we don't I don't know anything about this, but we we don't see Bollywood films to be able to review them, so we'll just go over that to number eight, which is Pan. I haven't seen this, but um, I understand uh, sort of Pan is not really entirely accurate. It's more, it has it's missing a couple of letters off the end. Yeah, the teen, yes, it, it's bad. It's, it's just, yeah, it's bad. At number seven, we'll gloss over it, and you're entry for the dressmaker because we'll be reviewing it a little bit later on. Yep. At number six is Steve Jobs. Yep, um, it's a uh, Danny Boyle taking on a script by Aaron Sorkin, who I love. I think it's a solely put together film. I think it's more of a, of a stage play than an actual film, uh, which I, I guess is kind of, I get is what Danny Boyle is kind of good at directing stage plays. But for me, the whole problem was that it didn't really suit being about Steve Jobs. It's got Steve Jobs in it. It's about sort of three launches that take place over different times. And that's it. It doesn't really have as much of a anything about the man behind you know the image of Steve Jobs it just has about the half the sort of half hour leading up to each of these presentations and that was a big problem for me I think Mas I think Michael Fassbender is absolutely fantastic in it I think that Seth Rogen is really really good in it um, I'm just honestly disappointed and it feels a bit like a like a lie like a false front to a film that it's basically gone you know here's a drama blah 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 let's oh we'll call the character Steve Jobs at number five is Brooklyn which I enjoyed but I, I've had I, I've, I've been really surprised that reviews that I've seen of it and people's comments I've said I, I've read that have said that they absolutely loved it thought it was amazing you know one of the best films of the year I thought it was good well performed but very very average in lots of other parts it didn't look anything especially brilliant there's points in it where it does look more as if it is a TV movie than it is a cinematic film and, and I know it's trying to be cinematic but it doesn't manage to pull it off and there's there's parts in it where I actually think it's quite mishandled in the way that it's filmed I think it's fairly well written it's based on a book but I don't know I don't know the book at all from the original book but uh, the thing I the issue I have with it is that some of the characters in it just feel very very they feel even though I don't know them from originally from the book I have feelings like they have been mistreated and number four is Hotel Transylvania 2 big disappointment not as funny anywhere near or even as imaginative or inventive as the original one um, it isn't you know Adam Sandler's worst film of course but it's, it's it, <laughs> but it's a, it's a case of that it's it really should be I mean, it reminded me of the whole thing of Monsters Inc. and Monsters University. Monsters University just had none of the spark that was there for Monsters Inc. It's exactly the same thing. It doesn't have that pizzazz that the Hotel Transylvania had that made me absolutely love it and laugh all the way through it. This didn't even make me laugh. It made me giggle, but nothing. You know, I I honestly felt like, what am I doing here? Yeah, and, and, and in a year when you've got such strong animated films, not like such strong, some of the best animated films we've seen this decade. So, yeah, it, um, it, it's really s silly for a company to release such lacklustre animated films like um, Hotel Transylvania 2. It shows you how uh, disappointing Hotel Transylvania 2 is. The Moomins film got better critical praise than Hotel Transylvania 2, and and we didn't manage to see it either, so we can't even compare yeah, it. You, you think to yourself, when you hear the name The Moomins, it's got, you're going to go, oh, no, it's going to be awful. But it got critical praise from it. I haven't seen it yet. Um, I don't think I'll actually watch it before the end of the year because I don't think it'll trouble my... Because uh, I take over Best Animated Film category-wise. So I don't think it'll actually trouble that at all. 
but that got better critical praise than Hotel Transylvania 2. And when you make a sequel to an original film where the film itself is not bad, but it's entertaining, you need to actually put it at least on par with that, if not better. Because we are, rev- well, you're being reviewed, you're going to review Inside Out finally. And Inside Out is just universes apart from something like Hotel Transylvania. Yeah. Just on going back to uh, Momentum in the chat, Stuart is saying apparently that uh, Momentum was released not only in cinemas but also on um, on demand online. So yeah, it's out on on demand, but we can't technically review it until no. it comes out on Blu-ray and DVD, which is not until January. I don't know if we have to start looking at it because I think it's starting to be unfortunately the way things are maybe heading a bit more. Well, if it helps smaller films, that's a good way to do it. But it, evidently, it hasn't helped momentum at all because <laughs> nobody seems to know about the movie. So, it's, hence the forty-six pound. And number three, the lady in the van. I haven't seen this yet, and I want to see this because I do like Maggie Smith. I think she's very, very good. Um, Maggie is Maggie Smith, though. No, Maggie, yeah, yeah, Maggie Smith. Yeah, Maggie Smith. Yeah. Um, and I do think she's really, really good, and she looks good and funny in this. But I haven't yeah. seen. You, she she is really really good in this. She she I wouldn't actually fully say that she carries the film because um, she doesn't just carry the film itself. It 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 is a fantastic performance from her. But you, you've also got um, a, alongside Dame Maggie Smith, you've got supporting roles from like Dominic Cooper and James Corden and Jim Broadbent and Russell Torvey and Francis De La Tour and so it, it it's. It's like the supporting cast alongside, but you've also got to give plaudits to Alex Jennings, who plays Alan Bennett, um, which this is actually written by Alan Bennett, and it's about his life from the 70s up to the 90s and about an old woman who moved into his driveway only supposedly for a couple of months when, in fact, she stayed for 15 years. Hmm. And you find out about her life, and it, it's touching at times, and it, it's really funny at times. It has a prob- problems every now and again because it sags a little bit, but it's definitely, it, it's a really entertaining, very well-made film. And number two, Spectre. Which is a perfectly fine Bond film, but I have issues with it. I have lots of reservations, actually, with the biggest thing I have the problem with in it, and I hate saying this, but the biggest problem I have with it is Daniel Craig in the film. He just feels as if he has lost all interest in the character and doesn't really want to be in it anymore. Um, it, it's... You know, competently written, competently directed by Sam Mendes, which it should be better than competently directed. It's a, it's an inferior follow-up to Skyfall, which it, it was, it shouldn't try and be another Skyfall, which thankfully it, it doesn't. It tries to be something different, but the problem is they, they try and be still more personal to Bond and and go that route, and it doesn't work for Bond. It's, it's got some little throwbacks and references to older Bond films, but. It's a film that is you can you can tell that it has issues when you're watching it. Um, supposedly there were reshoots um, not long before it was released, and I guarantee that the, the reshoots will probably be part of what the problem is. That somewhere along the line someone's gone, well that's not working. We need to look at this. We've changed this slightly, and they've maybe improved it from what it was, but it still has problems. I, I think yeah. it's actually underperformed. I think it should have done more. If it'd been a if it'd been a better film, it would have done more at the box office. I mean, it's taken eighty four million pounds, which is a lot for the UK box office. But I actually think it should have been nearer to a hundred by now. Yeah, I, I don't agree with what Stuart's saying in the chat. There, Bond's character was meant to be like that in the film, as he's burnt out. If you look at Katniss Everdeen in the Hunger Games series, she was burnt out after the first Hunger Games. Yet she had to go through turmoil and trouble and everything else. And yeah, she mourns and whimpers a bit, but she had to go through three films of turmoil, losing family members, things like that. Yet you still got a fantastic performance um, in that film. Whereas in this, Daniel Craig just it doesn't look like the character of Bond itself is bland. Daniel Craig himself looks bored of yeah. being James Bond. You can your character itself can go through a lot of trouble, but you can bring a lot of heart to that. But I I, I don't care of the fact that he lost everything. You need to show that you're actually portraying that properly. And Daniel Craig himself playing James Bond didn't look like he was doing that he looked like he was coasting um too much in the film it's it's much more boring than skyfall and using the excuse of him losing a lot for spectre it is i don't think it's a valid one because it it just it just isn't Mm. 
So the film itself, it hasn't done as well in the US um, as they were uh, yeah, as they were expecting it to do. It only land, uh, managed to steer in number uh, number one for a week. Yeah, I, I'm 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 not surprised by that. I'm disappointed because I wish it had been better. I do love the Bond films. This is, I mean, my favourites for Daniel Craig because I, I love Daniel Craig as Bond. I think he was a great casting. Casino Royale, I love. Um, I I like Skyfall almost as much as that, and then, um, Quantum of Solace is the worst out of all Daniel Craig's ones. But this, I actually, this is the third of his films for me. This is, you know, Casino Royale, Skyfall, Spectre, and then Quantum of Complete and Utter Waste of Time. Yeah, so I, I, I'm not a Bond fan, and I'll always say I'm not a Bond fan. So this is boring for me, really. I, I went in with low expectations, and it didn't even get to my low expectations. So that that says something about it. And the number one, which you might as well just go straight into yeah. the review of, is The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2. Yeah, because uh, we are reviewing the show on a Tuesday, so obviously we now got the box office. We've got the next, the next box office, yeah. Um, we normally would be doing it on the Monday and get the box office, then it's updated then the next day. Uh, so uh, Mockingjay Part 2 continues on from the end of the first one. Um, spoilers if you haven't seen the first one yet, where the, the movie c- continues literally from the, from the moment where... Katniss is waking up after having been attacked by Peter, who has been brainwashed by the Capitol. Um, she is sort of recovering from sort of the shock of that and having her basically her larynx crushed. Um, she is sort of dealing with all this while also ongoing. There are the plans still of you know sort of the the war of the rebellion of District 13 against the Capitol and sort of all the other districts in between sort of being forced to decide where they fall between the two um you have the whole thing of going on of that she sort of pushes for things to go she you know after this and after all the events she's experienced so far she pushes with president coin um played by julianne moore again um katniss pushes to go through the whole thing of that we we have to go for the capital i want to go to the capital i want us to go through i want to kill coin uh sorry i want to kill snow president snow um, who is the the one who's sort of you know leading everything from the capital? Um, of course, this means that what she needs to do is, against the orders of President Coin, sneak out and basically go to the front lines and join them. Um, essentially, pretending to be on a secret private mission to kill Snow. In fact, here's a clip. Squad four five one, you're my unit. Lieutenant Jackson is my second in command. Each one of you is elite in some form of combat, but we are a non-combat unit, so we'll be following days behind the frontline troops. You're to be the on-screen faces of the invasion, the Star Squad. It's been decided that you're most effective when seen by the masses. So we're not going to fight. You do whatever you're ordered to do, soldier. It's not your job to ask questions. Yes, sir. Even though we'll be working on abandoned streets miles behind the front lines, I guarantee you, wherever they put us, it will not be safe. This is a war zone. It is likely that we'll encounter both active pods and peacekeepers. You're considered high-value targets to the capital. Our unit has been given a hollow, a database that contains a detailed map of the capital and a list of every known pod. These pods can trigger anything from bombs to traps to mutts. Whatever they contain, they are meant to kill you. So, let's start off, first of all, with a big issue that we have with Mockingjay's uh, Mockingjay Part 2 um, first of all it has more endings than The Lord of the Rings and then hey, some that's mine that's my joke you no it's not it's not because I, I said it as I, well <laughs> I was the one who said that to you on um, on Facebook that I, well it, I, actually in what I put down on my <laughs> Facebook post after seeing the film that it has more endings than Return of the King <laughs> But I, I actually said that to someone else when I was walking out of it, so I, I said it before you as well, technically. But I was walking out before you, so it was out there in the, in the ether before you, so... Right, well, I, well, well, at least, first of all, we agree on that, then. Yeah. Um, the, the thing of it is, it's a film that... It's, it is... I, I, I'm not going to say it's a half a film, because it's not. The... The one before it, the part one, is a half a film. Part one, after having seen part one originally, I really had issues with it. I've seen it again a couple times since, and it has grown on me greatly. It's just the fact that it's a big departure from the previous two films. 
Um, and it's the thing that it then starts going into the whole propaganda of things. It starts becoming very political, which is very, very different from the first two films. Um, and the whole thing of it is then now you go you go back into a bit more in the action um, and less of the, polit- the politics until towards the end when it then starts to get very thick and heavy with the politics stuff again. Um, I really, really think it suffers from the fact of that they split this book in two halves. I mean, everyone's saying this. It's I think the book should not have been split into two parts. It shouldn't have been. It is. If you watch the two together, I guarantee it will be better. I think it actually should have been stripped down a little bit and made into a three-hour film, a single three-hour film. I get yeah, Lion Gate. So if you watch them both together, it'd still probably be shorter than watching the extended editions of The Hobbit. So it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's the fact of that if you watch the two of them together, I think there's even you know you'll watch it and you'll go, well, I would have taken this bit out, yeah, I would have taken this bit out, you know, and, and cram these bit together, and you know, it could have been written to have two scenes combined into one sort of thing. Um, as it's as it is, I now view part one as kind of like the prequel comic to a film. I don't view part one as actually being a separate film on its own. I view it as being part of part two. Um, uh, the thing is with it, part two is it, that even then it's not just it's not like with the Matrix films you had part one and then you had two and three which were done together and it's not action 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 it's actually action then it stops and you have sequences where people stop and they just sit and talk for a while um, and that could have been very very badly handled it could have been you know George Lucas original uh, uh, George Lucas prequels of Star Wars bad in that regard it's not it is handled well because of the fact of that there are characters there that are well prepared and well performed um, especially the whole thing of you have um peter who is um josh hutchinson you know going through this whole thing of he's in the middle of sort of breaking through his own brainwashing that's happened to him katniss is stuck at this whole thing of the you know this this love triangle between does she love him does she love gail um is she sort of ready for going and actually killing a man intentionally to sort of you know out of revenge for things and uh, it's a film that i was not as entertained as i wanted to be i think it's a solid film but i don't think it is the better of any of the others i actually think it's if you're going to view them as several films i actually think it's the worst of all four films but i don't view three and four as sort of ten films so, so i mean it's it's i actually find this one if you watch this one on its own i think it would be you, you come away from it worse than viewing it with part one it, it's it's a film that it's it's really it's incomplete but it is a whole film and that's the weird thing about it because it's it's just the fact that it's got you know a start it has got a middle it hasn't got an end the part one has a start and a middle and doesn't have an end it's you know it's, it's a real mess having these two like that i i think it's entertaining i think a lot of people are going to be disappointed with it as a conclusion i do find i did find the last half hour of it was not only kind of condescending to the audience it was incredibly predictable as to what was going to happen towards the end and i actually found it just a, a big letdown and i'm i'm actually kind of annoyed that i wanted it to be more and it didn't the the, the thing i see with with the film i completely agree with your fact that with the part one of this um of the two-parter it, it has a start it has a middle but has no way of actually tying things together to maybe it's even drip feed you to lead you into the second part whereas with the you would expect the second part to be the start of the end and the end to just be an extended sequence when in fact it doesn't do that it actually has a start of its own because it, it it ends off the first part but then decides to start again so the end for the first part is in the second part of the film right at the start but then you start it all over again the problem with the film is it repeats itself too much there are too many scenes which involve Katniss sort of like trying to come to terms with this love triangle which I it doesn't exist it, it's not there at all there isn't so much rivalry between them that a love triangle is formed she has feelings for one because he is there looking after a family and that's where the feelings are attached to but she has emotional feelings for the other person because she was involved with a, such a, uh, a traumatic event in the first Hunger Games. That's where the emotional attachment is. So I always knew that she was always attached to one character rather than the other one. 
and set pieces in this film just don't seem to be handled very well. They try to add um, action set pieces to alleviate some of the elongated talky scenes, which there are a lot of in this film. And they work every now and again, but it just heavily relies too much on CGI and not much heart into them. There, for example, there is a it's a really well implemented scene. There's a horror scene in the film which involves them trailing through the, the sewers underneath them. Um, the city of um, the the second the second uh, city, mm -hmm. and so you, you it's handled quite well. It's got horror tropes in it. There is a little bit of tension. It's very well handled in that regard. To the, sort of the build up of scenes. You think you're sitting there thinking, oh, something's going to jump out of them, and it doesn't. And it's that whole thing of it building tension and building attention and building attention. The, the tension that it does very well. Yeah, when it but when it does release that tension, it feels like you're watching I Am Legend rather than watching Hunger Games. And so it, it's just the Mutt's character are just heavily CGI so bad that when bad things happen, you sort of like detach yourself a little bit from it when that's not the case. It's a very human film and having heavily CGI monsters like that in the film doesn't help it at all. There mm -hmm. is some brilliant performance in it. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence has always been fantastic as, uh, as Katniss Everdeen, um, going through everything from being really high up with her family and enjoying life even though she's in pretty much the capital as the one who's ruining everybody's life but she's still got a life with her family to being the, the absolutely destroyed and destructive and being used as a puppet pretty much i i think jennifer lawrence has handled the character fantastically throughout the series and it's the same with other characters i would have liked to see more of effie i've loved her character through the movie i i think she's She's a brilliant, brilliant character played by Elizabeth Banks. I would have liked to see her even more so. Woody Harrelson pops up every now and again, but he's majorly underused, even though he has been a strong character through, throughout the series. Um, and some of the stuff, especially also the way it plays out the bad guys. The bad guys are so flat and one-dimensional, they just don't have any depth to them. And when a, a really dramatic scene hits, you sort of predict where it's come from as well. And so it's easy, I agree with you, when it, um, it's easy how to predict the film. It's so easily predictable. Even if you've not read the books, you can mm -hmm. piece together the puzzle perfectly. So it's a movie, I completely agree with you also on the point that it is the weakest out of the four. Um, I would gladly sit down and watch the other three, even the, the uh, part one of Mockingjay, because it's an interesting political movie. Yeah. And I would gladly sit down with this. I wouldn't say I would gladly sit down to, the, to this one. I would only do it if I was watching one, two, and three, and then I had to watch it to end off the the series. Yeah, it's a weird thing to say. I mean, but I'm, I, if I think back to what a comparable sort of films like this, I thinking recently because obviously Bond talking about Spectre in the top ten, um, Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace. Now, Quantum of Solace is a terrible. It's not really even a whole film on its own. It is. I view it as Casino Royale, and then Quantum of Solace is like Casino Royale and a half. It's the you know the add-on to Casino Royale that continues from there, but it doesn't have its own story. It's a weird thing to say, but it's kind of the other way around with this. Whereas you have the, um, Mockingjay Part One is kind of the add-on for Mockingjay Part Two, but without Mockingjay Part One, Part Two is which is sort of the more confident part is a complete and utter failure. Which is the weird thing that doesn't make sense. And also, what doesn't make sense is. Not just this this film because it has some like five different endings. Um, the whole entire series has about seven, eight, nine different endings in total, <laughs> and it, it's just silly. And the way they handled the last section, the last twenty minutes, is so rushed and so it, it's sort of like a dichotomy with each other. It's so rushed in parts, yet it's so dragged out in other parts. And in the parts where it's so dragged out, those are the sections which you wish w were rushed. Whereas the parts that were rushed, you wish they were actually expanded more so. I have, I have a question actually for you and I'm wondering Stuart if he had maybe his opinion as well um, because of the fact of that towards the end um, especially right at the end the whole political sort of side of it um, I could tell when watching it there were some shots that they had digitally replaced and used previous shots to put in Philip Seymour Hoffman's character there um, and I could tell that I'm quite good at sort of noticing that and, and I, I wonder if this the ending was affected because of the fact of that obviously he'd passed away and they had to use sort of digital recreation of him to get it to sort of all kind of make sense with his character's part because his character was kind of fairly important in the last one in in part one 
Um, and then obviously sort of comes into fruition everything to do with his character, what has been going on through to the end of this. Well, the, the, um, the, the way they had to do it also, the letter. Yeah. Which, is, which was a, a bit of a... It's a weird way to do it, considering the way they ended Fast and Furious 7. Seeing something like this and ending it with a letter... Hmm. Is a is a bit strange to do it. I, I when I watched the ending, I thought Jennifer Lawrence was CGI'd, because the way we just seen her body her body movements and her facial movements, it looked like she was CGI'd and not Philip Seymour Hoffman through the film. I think they did a better job with him than they did with the CGI at the end. So mm. it's, it's it's just interesting the way they they did that. Okay, on to the other release recovery this week then. Yeah, um, because obviously with the Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2 being out, it's like the spectre of things, and other films didn't want to go up against it, and so the only other uh, release of the week that was released in more than, I would, I would say, 200 screens was uh, The Dressmaker, directed by Jocelyn Morehouse, and it is a small little film, and it's also featuring Liam, Liam Hemsworth as well. Um, and so it stars Kate Winslet, who plays Myrtle Tinny, Tilly Dunnage, and it's set in the um, very early 50s, and she decides to go back to her hometown of Dungatar, which is this, I wouldn't even call it a town. It's the kind of thing that when you're on a train or, or something like that, when you go past something and you see, like, eight small little houses and maybe one tiny little shop, that's pretty much what Dungatar is. And so she returns back there, and um, she's now an adult, from incidents that happened in a small town when she was a child, specifically involving the church and the 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 priest there at the church, she she absolutely hated her. The kids used to pick onto her a lot, and she's now successful. She travelled across Europe. She's a fashion designer, and evidently people in this town really want her services, despite an incident that happened when she was a child. And so, for her to get round the people in the town, she decides to do makeovers on everybody, making them proud of themselves leading to a dance where one girl she goes from being um i, I don't want to use the word a bit of a dog but it, it's sort of like what her character <laughs> is actually tread like in the film itself so a bit of a downtrodden character to being a cinderella-esque character now she falls in love myrtle falls in love with liam hemsworth's uh, character and this scene um is just one of those setup scenes which involves her trying to help him out she tells them if they want it done proper, they've got to strip and be measured because it's a work of art made special for them and no one else. You see, Tilly, I do listen. She tells them that they're all different, even though they're all the same. Too fat, too skinny. You'll be a sight for sore eyes. Anyway, lo and behold, our genius here does make them look different. Less like themselves and more like they want to be. Don't you? You just called me Tilly. When? Just then? Oh, I never. Yes, you did. And this morning? Twice. Oh, li liar. Oh. Sounds like this is the most important piece of clothing I'll ever own. And so in that clip there, you heard uh, Judy Davis, who plays uh, Molly, who's um, Tilly, or Myrtle's uh, mother. She here has been called Tilly. And she also here to being called Myrtle, so you can't win through this film. And you've also got Hugo Weaver, who plays a very interesting sergeant. This is a, a sergeant who is conflicted between not only his sexuality, but also he has a slight penchant for fabric. Uh, he actually had not a slight penchant, he has a major penchant for fabric. And there is a really awkward scene in the movie, which when i went to see the film it made people laugh but it's sort of like that wincing kind of laugh where you don't know if you should be laughing or feel slightly creeped out by it and i think he handles the character really well and that's the same with pretty much everybody else who's involved with this one liam helmsworth plays um, the character of teddy who falls in love with uh, with tilly and i think his character is very well rounded very well played out judy davis is by far the the standout of the cast she is really funny she goes because she's um, she's lost a memory of her daughter, and she goes from somebody who's very downtrodden to somebody who's sarcastic beyond belief, and it's brilliantly brilliantly done by Judy Davis. Kate Winslet, you heard in that uh, clip there, her Australian accent is spot on. It never um, it never disappears throughout the entirety of the film. She manages to hold it perfectly through that, and I think she plays. Um, 
Tilly really well. There are times in the film itself where it sags a little bit, but overall, the movie is really enjoyable to watch. It's funny. It has a bit of a switch about two-thirds into the film where it goes from being um, a comedy movie with sort of like a dark comedy movie, even though the comedy is very straightforward, to something that reminds you a lot of a revenge film and so somebody who's out to get, kill somebody or something like that and it flips a switch and it goes into that kind of mode after after constant bad news for Tilly's character and so it's handled really well the way those two are actually stitched together because you would think that it would sort of like detract a little bit or feel a bit fractured but overall the film itself is very enjoyable and especially when going up against the Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2 this is the stronger film. That's honestly surprising. I wasn't expecting you to say that. I was expecting a, a rant from you of some sort. I haven't seen it, and I want to see it, but I just wasn't able to. I'm not at the time, so no, I'm going to have to I try and fit myself, this in. I, I found myself laughing at, at times. It definitely reached, uh, reached the, in my terms anyway, the four laugh test. So it re reached the four laugh test really easily. Um, but there, there is still, there is still like heart in the film as well. Because it's such a small contained movie, it manages to tell the story perfectly. It gives you the flashbacks that you need to fill in blanks, and so it's really. I think it's it's a good film. A surprisingly good film. Okay, that's it for the cinema section. Um, only those two films we're covering this week. Obviously, Hunger Games will have been chasing away anything else uh, quite a few next week but we'll get to them towards the end of the show. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with this week's DVD and Blu-ray section. There was a, a real sense of you were doing something wrong, but that did give it that, that feeling of excitement. When the reveal of the film happens, that's when it just becomes absurd. And the atmosphere and just the sense you get whenever you go into it is undeniable. It, it did absolutely zero for me, which could be for the hype. What we've just discussed there is just scratching the surface on it. Hi, I'm Eric England, the director of Contract, and you're listening to From Page to Screen, the horror show. And welcome back to this um, week's Monday Movie Show. We're into the DVD and Blu-ray section where we're looking at these films. Yep, we have uh, Disney Pixar back on top form, I will add, even before getting to it, uh, with Inside Out. We have a um, quite sort of strongly acted, strong sort of film around boxing with Southpaw. Uh, comedy with Ted 2. Uh, we have sort of horror drama with Maggie, surprisingly starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. And ending out with a comedy uh, with Hot Pursuit. And also TV Movie of the Week and Stuart just put in the live chat. Ooh, cool advert. I wonder why. Yeah. I wonder why that advert that we just played could have been cool. Because I was involved. That's why it's cool. Blu-ray DVD top 10. <laughs> uh, starting at number 10 with I Believe in Miracles. Yeah, it, it's not based on the song. Uh, we haven't seen it. It's based on uh, Brian Clough's... Um, not life, but the time that he had with Nottingham Forest back in the back in 1979 and 1980 when they won the European Cup back to back European Cups actually, and how much of a big team Nottingham Forest were thanks to uh, Brian Clough. If you've seen some football documentaries, things like that, you you see how how much he pulled that team around, how brilliant he, he was with that. And it's um, it's a documentary which speaks to people who were involved with Nottingham Forest back then, uh, Viv Anderson, Gary Bertles, Kenny Burns, and players like that. And they were huge, massive players because of what Brian Clough did. We, like I said, we haven't seen it. Yeah, um, I probably won't. Um, I definitely won't be seeing the number nine movie, Nativity 3, Dude, Where's My Donkey? Yeah, neither will I. <laughs> yeah, um, so we move on quickly to number eight, Big Hero 6. Fantastic film. Um, it, I think that people are buying it for Christmas presents. And I'm seeing more B, uh, BMX adverts on TV, thanks to Sky. Because when Sky latches under an advert, they really do milk it. Mm, yeah, it is one of those things that it's always it's, it has become so easily recognisable now, hasn't it? The character. So yeah, you know, it's... which is a good sign because that means um, uh, Disney have sort of like got a new character, a new property there, and so. As long as they don't milk it badly and release like 20 straight to DVD adventures with BMX in it, and we only see them once every couple of years, like the Minions, then we will be overloaded with it, but we won't be annoyingly overloaded with it. 
And number seven is a new entry from Michael McIntyre, Happy and Glorious, which is obviously stand-up. So going on to number six, which is a new entry for Downton Abbey Series 6 TV series, which we don't really go through. So number five, Terminator Genesis. Yeah, um... We're reviewing an old Schwarzenegger film a little bit later on, which is much stronger than Terminator Genesis. Um, Terminator Genesis is tolerable. That's the best I can see about it. Mm, I think it was a bit a bit better than that, but obviously we differ on things, so that's fine. Uh, Spy dropping down from last week's number one to number four. Yeah, um, I was hoping that Melissa McCarthy might turn around a bit of a corner and try to try her hand at something different and. Maybe Ghostbusters might sort of like push her in that direction when she there's obviously going to be humour from that, but they need to take themselves a little bit serious. And then she stars in a trailer for a film called The Boss, and it looks absolutely horrendous. And so this is an actress which I definitely have no hope for now. An exorcism needs to be done on her. I think she's possessed by a comedy demon who has no comedy timing whatsoever. Spy, however, is probably her best film comedy-wise. Um, and Paul Figg's yeah Paul Figg's best comedy film as well but I am doing it in such huge massive air quotes <laughs> yeah can we hear them sweeping yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, Frozen Fever the, sh- the Frozen Short is at number 3 um, we'll just go on straight to that because it's only a short to uh, Jurassic World at number 2 moving we back up the chart Jurassic World yeah majorly so yeah um, but it is great though yeah, it's good. Yeah. Um, so, of course, new entry from last week, number one. It's the Minions. Yep, that was a horrible impression. It was, it was, it's it was. Good. I don't know. It, it's probably going to be replaced by another animated film next week, so one and hey, two next hey, week. Hey, hey. No, I can't do it. I can't Stop. do it. Just, yeah. Minions will be number two next week, and probably Inside Out will be number one um, uh, next week. And so, yeah, I love the Minions film. I laughed my little bottom off about them. Um, I, just before we started the show, I watched. There's a new Minion short out there. It's done for three and a half minutes, and there's more comedy in that than there is in the entirety of Hotel Transylvania 2. Mm-hmm. And there that are, just tells you. So there are three yeah. mini movies on the Blu-ray actually, but only two of them have Minions in it. One of them is um, a complete separate one, which I was a bit disappointed by. But one of them is absolutely hysterical. I cannot remember what it was now, but it's it's absolute genius. It's yeah, just... the one I watched a little bit earlier on was involving two mini- Minion battling against each other. First, trying to get yeah. the kid into the basket yeah and then ultimately blowing each other up with a bomb <laughs> yeah it's that one it's absolute genius it's, it's typical minion behavior and it's brilliant yeah it's, it's online if you go on I, IGN's website or if you just go on to um, IMDB it's only on for three and a half minutes and they have released it online for you to watch and they, they, the minions are awesome I have not got this I know surprise surprise I have not got minions on uh, Blu-ray DVD I will be getting it I'm I'm, I doubt Black Friday will actually throw me up a decent bargain, but I'll still be buying it for myself for Christmas. Right, uh, first DVD of the night then. Yeah, Inside Out. Um, obviously Pixar's back with Disney again um, with a, a, a completely new concept movie here directed by Peter Dockerman. Sorry, Peter Dockerman, Peter Doctor and Ronnie Del Carmen. Um, it is centering around the sort of the this character... Um, and well of, of the character of joy um, is one of five feelings uh, joy sadness uh, fear anger and disgust um, are all sort of the the emotional range that supposedly everybody has inside them of these little characters that are inside your head and um, everything you experience is sort of all sort of them how they experience and they sort of lead you to behave in a certain way create memories and this affects how you are sort of created personality wise Um, we'll just play a clip actually which is just sort of introducing a couple of these emotions Go. All right, open. Hmm, this looks new. Make it safe. What is it? Uh, okay, caution. There is a dangerous smell, people. Hold on, what is that? This is disgust. She basically keeps Riley from being poisoned, physically and socially. That is not brightly colored or shaped like a dinosaur. Hold on, guys. It's broccoli! <laughs> yes! Well, I just saved our lives. Mm. Yeah, you're welcome. Riley, if you don't eat your dinner, you're not going to get any dessert. Wait, did he just say we couldn't have dessert? That's anger. He cares very deeply about things being fake. So that's how you want to play it, old man? No dessert? Oh, sure. We'll eat our dinner right after you eat this. Ah! Riley, 
Here comes an airplane. Oh, airplane. We got an airplane, everybody. <gasps> <laughs> and so um, you have this whole thing of them all sort of being in the head and new memories are created um, after several years and now Riley is now sort of 11 years old. Um, things are sort of going, you know, fine one day when there is a issue with Sadness who starts to, without sort of meaning to, corrupting sort of happy memories and turning them sad. Um, this, this leads to joy and sadness kind of getting into a bit of a confrontation accidentally getting sort of sucked into a pipe and then being sort of sent to a place where the memories are stored um unfortunately taking the core memories with them the memories that make up the personality um which makes up this entire world in our head and so of course without these core memories there the world starts to kind of deteriorate and collapse um it's it's one of those weird things it's, it's weird to try and explain it but that I think is the best way I can do it there is explain it do it any kind of justice um, it is Disney and Pixar doing what they do best and coming up with completely imaginative new ideas new sort of weird ways of looking at things and looking in this case of memory and personality um, and how a, a sort of a person is made up it's a very interesting idea and it's, it's done with such a, a, a an intelligence and and genuine heart to it all that you can't help but get completely sucked into it um, there's even a great thing of where when they get in these memory sections and they're sort of running around trying to find their way back to well essentially the brain um, that, that part of the control brain um, they meet sort of like the what used to be her um, imaginary friend who is now being you know kind of forgotten about and put in long-term memory and you know is actually in long-term memory running around and helping them and it's just little ideas like that that are brilliant there's a great bit when they take a shortcut between two of the worlds that have been created and they go through abstract and they start getting changed into abstract animations which is brilliant and weird and it's something that you've never kind of thought of before but it's done in such a way that you're honestly sitting there and you're just going wow just i just ate it up i loved it i laughed i laughed i i was just smiling all the way through it it's brilliant and it's a genuinely emotional film that people will connect with if not strongly at least on some point in some way you will find something in it that is just to love and just enjoy and that's that's basically what Pixar does best. They are hitting everything right on. Yeah, well, it, it's um, Pete Doctor who who uh, directed this and written this as well. He's a strong writer. He did the original Toy Story and mm. Up and Wally, Monsters Inc. as well. And so he's also writing yeah, there. But not but not Monsters University. You see oh, what happened yeah. there. So he got out in, in time with this. And yeah. It, it's well, no, if he'd been if he I think if he'd done Monsters University, it would have been good. <laughs> he's he's got um, you've got tropes from each one of those he's sort of like handpicked the best bits from each of the stuff that he's written and created something unique again this is a guy who seems to write his own rule book book over and over and over again and with this it, it's it's one of those films where it's hard to not latch on to at least one of the characters because everybody feels disgust Everybody feels anger. Everybody feels afraid. Everybody feels sad. Everybody feels happy. No matter no matter what, you feel one of the emotions that's inside Riley. So you instantly latch on to one of the characters, if not multiple ones, and it's hard not to latch on to all of them because they've all got such their own personality. It, it, it's brilliantly well implemented. It even made me cry on a couple of times. It, it, it's that well done. The animation is beautiful. It's up there with some of the best. Unfortunately, in about 10 years' time, it'll probably not age as well, but it's still up there with some of the best animation that, that's out to deer. And this is Pixar easily at their best. It's definitely at, at their best. And I loved Inside Out. And this is the reason why Inside Out is giving me a headache um, to try and pick the best animated film of the year. <laughs> you should be glad you're not doing that. Because I've got the unfortunate job of having to do that. I've got. Uh, Pixar's latest film, which is out on Friday. Do you, do you want to um, pick best soundtrack then? 
No, you can do that because you're, you're, <laughs> that, that's your expertise. Um, animated films, I'm pretty decent with animated films. I, I'm not using the horror category this year because I don't want to. But um, animated films, I've, like I said, I've got Disney Pixar's latest film, The Good Dinosaur, which should have been out before this one. There wasn't supposed to be two movies this year. Um, next year, there's only one film. But yeah, um, The Good Dinosaur is out on Friday. I mean, word of mouth is saying it's good, but nowhere near as good as Inside Out. Mm. But yeah, the Inside Out and Song of the Sea and um, there's just multiple animated films which is giving me a horrible headache and trying to choose the best animated film of the year. So thank you very much, Pixar, for making a brilliant film. Is it House of Transylvania 2 then? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Um, let's move on then to the next film, which I think Stuart's looking forward in chat, seeing what you had to say about this. We were just chatting briefly about Southpaw, so what do you think of it? Yeah, it's directed by Antoine Fuqua. It's a dodgy surname to try and see. When um, a friend who I worked with, he, he absolutely adores this film, and he was shocked that I hadn't seen this film. And he didn't know the director's name, and like a little kid, he giggled at the surname. So you can probably guess why. But yeah, hmm. it stars uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, my personal favourite actor, um, who plays Billy Hope, who's a boxer, who's actually an undefeated boxer, 41-0, and zero, and you might, I might as well just play this clip. In this clip, he, he's at a press conference after winning his latest fight. Billy, most of us here had you winning this early. Were you expecting such a difficult fight? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Expect, I don't know, you can't expect anything. Um... I, I was really looking forward to just showing up, walking the ring, and then having him fall on the ground. Billy, hey Billy. No, I mean, I mean, I expected a hard fight. You know, um, put my family through a lot. Uh, by the way, Layla, if you're watching, go to sleep, baby. <laughs> Billy, hey Billy, 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 you're 43 and 0, undefeated. Are you running out of? So can you say that again? Yeah. It's impressive. But who are you gonna fight? Who are you gonna uh, fight? You know that's really Jordan. I think I know Me. one. Me. <laughs> I mean, all the fans around the world they want to see it. I mean, y'all tell me, who else is there? Your crew knows it. All these beautiful people in here know it. I know it. I just want to know why you won't give me my shot. All I want is my shot. I just want my shot. Sorry, I'm sorry. Who are you? <laughs> no, exactly who I am. And so a tragic incident happens, which I'm not going to spoil, even though it's in the trailer, but I, I just don't want to spoil it, which spirals um, Billy's life out of control. He loses his daughter. He needs to try and pick his um, self up. He's become an alcoholic. He's uh, been become slightly obsessed with drugs. And so with the help of Forrest Whitaker's character, who plays Tick, he um, works at a small little uh, gym who helps downtrodden children or people who've lost their way to try and teach them boxing. He needs to train them up because he's been invited to um, a fight which is hosted by 50 Cent's character to try and become the star that he once was. Now, central to this film, you need a strong performance from your lead actor and you've definitely got that. That's one of the boxes that's been majorly ticked by Jake Gyllenhaal. When somebody puts in all the time and effort to look like he does in in South Park, Jake Gyllenhaal, he's a chameleon of an actor. He went from doing something like Nightcrawler, where he was skinny, emancipated, looked very like Gollum-esque in a way, to somebody who's so beefed and buffed up like he is in South Park. That's an actor who cares about the roles that he plays. And so... He embodies the character brilliantly well. He plays the character brilliantly well. You can hear in the way he actually speaks there. He's got sort of like, even though he snaps a lot, he seems to be very somebody who's, he's sort of like in a shell in a way. The way his character speaks, it's not like a character who outbursts a lot. He mumbles a lot through the way he actually, he sees his lines. And so it's really well implemented by that. It's just a pity that you've got a strong character in a film that's quite weak. The film itself, it, it it falls too much on tropes that have been used multiple times before, but it doesn't actually do anything interesting with those tropes. You've got the important incident that happens which spirals his character out of control. Fine, that's been done in multiple films before. It's okay to use them because they're good templates to actually use, but you need to try and build on those templates a little bit of a different way, and it never manages to do that. You've got a montage sequence in it, which reminds you multiple times of Rocky or, or films that attempted to do that. 
You've also got, and I, I'm probably going to get shouted at this, but you've also got a film that supposedly has heart and depth when it has no heart or depth in it whatsoever. If you put it alongside a movie like Warrior, which involves two brothers um, uh, going up against each other in, in MMEA, you've got a film which uses its running time perfectly because it explores the characters and it explores the problems that's happened with the characters and trying to res- try to resolve it, but not instantly try to resolve it. Whereas this film, it doesn't explore the turmoils and troubles with the characters very well. The, the depth is lacking. There is no depth there. So it's a movie that's that's lacking pretty much in a lot of territories, which is boosted majorly by the fantastic performance of Jake Gyllenhaal. I really wanted to like this film. I really did want to like this film. I thought it was good. It's not the excellent film a lot of people are making it out to be. And Stuart, you can stop banging your head against the wall now because <laughs> what did you expect from me? <laughs> I breathe. Hang on, I breathe before banging my head against the wall. So I was just reading that. <laughs> Every single review that I do, Stuart hates me more so. <laughs> so it, it's you. You should actually be used to me by now. But it, it, that is the case. I adore um, Jake Gyllenhaal, but I think the problems with the film is down to the director. It's down to Antoine Fuqua. I don't think he's a strong enough director. I just, I just don't. If this movie was in the hands of somebody who's a bit more of a competent director, I think he would have looked at the script. And I think he would have concentrated on trying to tie up ends in the script, which are just too baggy and too loose, and made it a much more stronger film. I, I it's unfortunate. I agree overall with the film. I think I disagree that, that I think it's Anton Fuqua. I do think it's Anton Fuqua's fault. I think it's though that it's taken a script which isn't entirely fleshed out as it should be, and then has tried to basically fill in the bit, fill in the gaps while filming it, and instead of actually getting the script finished properly and then putting it together and then filming a great script with a great performance, instead of just filmed an average script with a great performance. Um, when you're a director of a film, if you, should, look, yeah. if you look if you look over a script and you think it's average, why would you even attempt to even shoot that film? Well, I mean, it's it's a case of that if he thinks there's enough there to go with it, and he will. But it's a case of that I think because he's his previous films he's done before. I mean, he did Training Day. He's done films where he, he definitely can do what is necessary to create a great, a well-directed film. I think he just had a misstep in this one. So I I do think it's his fault, but I don't think that it's that he's a bad director. I think it's just that he's had a misstep for some reason I mean I I think as a, I think as a worst thing was what he did with the equalizer previously I absolutely hated um, this I didn't I this I enjoyed but it's it's like legend with Tom Hardy's performance legend is a very average film overall but it is elevated to such a height because of Tom Hardy's performance in it yeah, it's because Jake Gyllenhaal actually cares about the character, which makes me slightly more annoyed at the film. When you've got an actor who puts so much effort, so much time, so much heart into the character that he has done in South Park, in a, such an average film, it makes you really more annoyed at the film for doing that. Okay, uh, I'm going to go on to Ted 2, which is uh, written and directed by Seth MacFarlane. It is the continuation of the story of Ted, the teddy bear that was uh, brought to life through a wish. Um, you have John, played by Mark Wahlberg, returning again, um, along with Seth MacFarlane voicing Ted. Um, Ted, who is now, um, at the start of the film, married to his girlfriend, Tammy Lynn. Um, things a year later are not going so great for them in their relationship. So um, what do they do? They decide they're going to have a kid. Um, Ted, essentially though, not being quite well equipped to be able to do that, um, has to start looking around to find other means to be able to do this. Um, He then looks at going to a uh, fertility clinic to get um, a uh, donor uh, for Tammy Lynn and problems then arise because of the fact that it turns out that things that they've gone through to investigate this and do all this, it turns out that Ted is no longer, is not actually considered a living person, he is considered property. So, of course, what do they do? They need to go and sue the government to actually sort of get his civic rights back, his civil rights back, uh, where they start looking for a lawyer and end up meeting Amanda Seyfried's character who has a rather unusual name. Hello? Oh! Hi. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. 
You must be Ted. Yeah, uh, I'm Ted. This is my buddy John. Hi. Uh, my uncle says that you guys are my first clients. Uh, it's been discussed, but um, do you mind if I ask how old you are? I'm 26. Ah. Uh, what is there a problem? Well, you know, I just don't want my lawyer singing Frozen songs during the opening arguments. Oh, I'm Samantha Jackson. Ted, how are you? Good to meet you, John. Nice to meet you. Wait, wait, wait. What's your middle name? Leslie. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, so you're Sam L. Jackson. Just like Sam L. Jackson. Who is that? You ever seen any movie ever? He's the black guy. So as you heard in that clip, it has that kind of Seth MacFarlane thing. If you know Family Guy, you know the Seth MacFarlane kind of shock level humour that there is. I mean, that's quite subtle for Seth, Seth MacFarlane in the film. Um, and, th- th- I mean, this is no exception to sort of his other films. You have, obviously, the first Ted and then um, A Million Ways to Die in the West. And it's, I mean, it's better than A Million Ways to Die in the West. It's not better than the first Ted film. It has its problems of that it's it, it's doing the same thing again. It's literally, you know, you kind of take it in the same way as The Hangover, where you have this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens, and they're the same kind of arcs that happen in the story around about the same point in the film, only they may happen in a slightly different way to a different character or something like that. And it's just laziness. It's lazy sequel. It has a couple of gags in it here and there that did make me laugh, I will admit, but not anywhere near as much as the first film, which is what you and I both loved the first one. It was our best film of that year, our favourite film of the year for when it was released, and this one, it won't be... I don't think it'll be in my top ten of the year, even. It's... It's a, I mean, you've got Giovanni Ribisi is back from the first film. Sam Jones is brought back in a continuing joke from the first one. Um, and, um, you know, it's it's just literally... Uh, it, it has no... Nothing new. It doesn't bring anything new to it. Even, you know, it brings a Man of Seafried new in. Um, presumably, I don't know the reason why, but Mila Kunis left, the first, left after the first one and didn't look exactly back. Involved. Um, I don't know the reason for her leaving, but I think she got the better half of the deal. I mean, it's I'm not saying it's a bad film. It's fun. It's enjoyable. It's just after the first one, you want a lot more out of it, and it just doesn't deliver. It suffers from the same problems as A Million Ways to Die in the West. Um, I, I love Seth MacFarlane. I think he's, a, a, he's um, fantastic at his writing. He's very witty at his writing. But I think he's showing that he's much more of a, a TV writer than he is a movie writer. Because I, I think Ted was a bit of a, a lucky hit for him. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, with the mil- a million ways to die in the West was such a misstep for him. And then unfortunately, by the um, Ted Two is pretty much the same. It's not as bad as a million ways to die in the West. I did laugh a couple of more times in Ted Two than I, I did do with that one. But it, I, I think that he's a fantastic singer. He can write music brilliantly. I think he can write TV um, episodes of Family Guy and American Dad fantastically as well. I just don't think that he is a movie writer. Mm. I just don't think that he, he can he can write films or direct films. It's also as well it has a couple of moments in it which I genuinely was kind of creeped out by. There's a there's a Liam Neeson cameo in it, which is honestly quite excruciatingly uncomfortable and kind of really poor humoured. I think. And I, I sat there and I was kind of like, oh, is this, you know, and, and I want, I was like, fair enough, have that be in the film. Don't have it drag out for two minutes what could be ten seconds and be a much funnier throwaway gag than something that you just, you literally make the audience go, okay, I feel like I need a shower. Yeah, I, I think Ted would actually work better as a TV program. I think it would, actually, yeah. I think it would, it would be a lot, it would be a lot more concise fitting it into 25 minutes than trying yeah. to stretch it out to two hours because you, you look what he's done with family guy over the years and how much it's changed over the years and he can he can sort of like bring a friend's kind of esque um style to to ted and so it could have worked much better as a as a tv program i really hope that he doesn't decide to go with a ted 3 but i think there is going to be a ted 3 and it's unfortunate if that's the case mm. um maggie is uh, the next film of the week, uh, directed by Henry Hobson. It stars Arnold Schwarzenegger, who plays uh, Weird Vogel, who's the father of um, his daughter, the title character of Maggie, played by Abigail Breslin in the movie. 
and um, he is seeking out his daughter after an outbreak that's happened across the population of the entirety of the world where people are contracting a virus which turns them into zombie-like people. And now uh, after spending a few weeks to try and find his daughter, he finds her in a hospital. The hospital says to him, yes, you can take her home. She will start deteriorating over the next few days, ultimately going into a zombie state. That's when you've got the, the really bad decision. Do you kill her or do you bring her back to us and we'll contain her? And so the film itself, it's set over the next few days of him spending the last time with his daughter. Here's a clip. You spent two weeks out there looking for me? Yeah. I made a promise to your mother that I will protect you. Yeah, but what about you guys? What if I hurt you? We know the precautions. You shouldn't have brought me back. And so th this is um this is a virus movie that's more told on a much more sedate pace. When you, you normally get these kind of films, it's all about the outbreak, um, a group of survivors going up against a horde of zombies or a horde of virus victims. Um, I think one of the, the better films is The Crazies. I think the way they handled that film was fantastically done because the people knew what they were doing, but they were infected with this. The way they've done it with this is a much more emotional story. Whereas um, it, it is centered around a father and his daughter and coming to terms with the fact that he is going to lose his daughter. He, his daughter is losing memory of what her life used to be like before the outbreak happened, before she was infected. And so it's a much more personal film and I think it's handled, handled very well by Schwarzenegger. I think he, he, he plays his character with such emotion and such... Um, just father-like characters the way he would actually act in a film rather than go out all guns blazing trying to hunt down the people who infected her he wants to spend the last few ta um, hours that he's got with his daughter together with her Abigail Bresner I think she's a very smart smart actress um, she does every now and again pick films that sort of like a bit of a sidestep or stars in movies that people completely forget for example she was in a fantastically little very weird movie called Haunter which I actually enjoyed but did really bad at the box office and was thrown out there and very few people have actually seen it but I recommend Haunter and in this one her character of Maggie is very well constructed very well played out and so ultimately it's a depressing movie sort of like got a style of the road a little bit in it not as depressing as the road because the road is it's yeah. a very, very hard watch. This yeah. is not like that. This is not a hard watch, but it's got a feel of like watching the road. And I think Schwarzenegger handles himself really well. I think Abigail Breslin handles herself really well. And even though you've got help from Julie Richardson's character who plays Carol and who's going out with Schwarzenegger's character in the film, they don't fully concentrate on her that much and you're not overly bothered about that because all you care about is, is what's happening to um, th this family. Okay, the last film of the evening is Hot Pursuit. It is directed by Anne Fletcher. It is basically, it's a, I tell you what, it is a buddy movie. It has, um, at the centre of the film, we have Cooper, played by Reese Witherspoon, who is a um, sort of a patrolman. She um, is brought in to go with a, a deputy marshal to help with um, a, um, a sort of a cartel member who is turning um you know evidence and is sent along to sort of help pick them up um a husband a man and his wife to take them into protective custody uh when she gets there there is a shootout um she ends up sort of escaping with the wife played by sofia vergara um and sort of trying to get her to come along with her even though she's kind of unwilling so she can keep her safe and get her into protective custody here's a clip 
You don't have to like me, but I'm the best chance you have at surviving. What the heck is that? Felipe must have put baking powder in the car. <laughs> How much baking powder? I don't know. Maybe like 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 42 kilos. Hey, are y'all okay? I took that turn way too fast. What the heck is this white stuff? Baking, baking powder. powder. We're bikers. Toast, muffin, cakes. Muffin. I should call the police. No, I am the mother of the police. Don't you see? Uh, there's no major damage here. You're free to go. But I destroyed your car. I said you're free to go! Except I need you to drop us off at the nearest establishment where we can buy some clothing at a reasonable price, but more importantly, at a reasonable price. I said that before, didn't I? It's gonna be all so, I mean, I'm not going to come out and lie, it's pretty awful, it's terrible, it's just, it's horrible, it's it's not funny, you have these two characters who you don't care about, uh, Sofia Vergara, I don't mind her normally in things, you know, I've seen her in um, the TV show she does, um, Modern, Modern Family, yeah, and she's perfectly fine in that, in this, can't stand her, her character is so annoying, she's so annoying, Honestly, if if I had been Cooper, if I, if it had been, I probably would have shot her myself. It's it's just, it's one of these ones where it's like you know circumstances happen that they end up getting sort of on the run and then one problem after another and it's it's one of these coincidence movies where it's literally just every coincidence that could come along under the sun just to try and stretch out the film to a a sort of decent running time and it's not even an hour and a half and it just feels like it goes on forever and it's just awful it's sorry it's just it's one of these it's one of these you know comedy by committee it, i mean it's it's i'll put it this way this is how how awful nominee bad it was i would have gladly sat through another paul feig movie instead any paul feig movie what's even more annoying is reese witherspoon set up a new production company and uh, the first film she released under that production company was wild, wild yeah and the, you know especially in the last year she's done that she go from wild to this honestly what are you doing with your career yeah and she did the good lie under that production company as well and then hot pursuit and hey yeah. I, I can't stand Sofia Vakara. I think she's really annoying. She's one of those ones who sounds like a chipmunk that should be shot. Um, but if you li listen to that clip there, you heard Reese Witherspoon. She's hyper in the movie, well, parts of the film. And it's when you've got somebody who's hyper speaking to somebody who's got that annoying, grating voice, you just want to bang your head against anything that's beside you. I had to sit and watch this film in a cinema. And it, it is, uh, it brings back horrible, horrible memories. I had to walk out and ask the maitre d's or the people in the cinema if they happened to have multiple paracetamols. Because it was the only way my head would actually calm down. It, it, I hated the film. I really hated the film. And you, the, the thing is, though, what I find even more interesting is I've seen ten films worse than this. So this will not make my worst ten list. It might make my dishonorable mentions. But I have actually seen ten films worse than this, so you can imagine what kind of year it has been. Well, I mean, there it's are ten movies it, out here that are worse than this. It's that whole thing of you know you have a scale, you have the scale of great on one end and bad on the other, and without one, you don't have the other. If you don't have the great, you don't have the bad. You know, you can't tell one with the other. But then you have this middle ground of the films that are so terrible that they're not even memorable for being that bad, and this edges towards that middle ground of being so bland and just a, a complete waste of talent material effort everything that you kind of not intentionally but your memory just kind of obliterates it from existence yeah literally i've just seen a piece of news there that um tremors is going back to the tv screens again Un under jason bloom with Kevin Bacon. Okay. With Kevin Bacon. With Kevin Bacon. In TV? Yeah, television. Hmm. Okay. So it's going for a TV reboot with um, Jason Bloom attached to his production company because he's done a production company now side of uh, Bloomhouse Productions that handles television. Um, Elevator is one of the programs that he does. Yep. Um, Kevin Bacon is the one who's going to be attached to it and he's going to be doing it. Hmm. So that, that's interesting. Um that's it for the new releases of this week TV movies of the week then I've got a few I've cheated again 
Yes, Jim, here. Yeah. Um, might have some, might have some of the same ones though. Probably. So. Um, I've got two on Thursday night. Yeah, I've got two, um, one on Thursday night. Yeah, I think I've got the same one first off. Nine o'clock, film yeah. four, seventy one. It's the premiere of seventy one. It is. Yes. Um, which I know Stuart should be having something to do about with the, from the British podcast, um, but it is a great sort of British. Um, well, not really an action, more of a thriller film um, set around the troubles and with a soldier left sort of behind behind the, the lines um, during uh, a sort of a raid, and it's actually really really good. And it's it's one of the three films that Jack McConnell was in, where he was in you know. Oh, is it O'Connell? Why have I forgotten it's O'Connell? O'Connell yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, it's one of the three films, though. I mean, obviously, you had that, you had Unbroken, and you had Starred Up, which was just, he just, you know, came out altogether. Starred Up was the strongest one out of the three. Yeah, but this was no, you know, no sort of detriment against this. All three of them were great that, performances, and this was a, this was one as well. Yeah, that's what Film for should have done, actually, and because uh, I'm guessing you're going to see the next film, which is on after it, but... The yeah. way they should have done it is they should have done 71 and then they should have showed start up to it after it. They should have, yeah, but instead they've shown Dread, which is perfectly fine because Dread is one of my favourite films recently that was completely underrated and overlooked and needs to be seen because it's just, it's a, it's criminal that it didn't do better and we haven't had further films. And pretty decent 3D as well. Yeah. It's coming from me. And that's the thing that's annoying. It was released only in cinemas in 3D. And the 3D is actually good, but people rebucked it because of the fact of it being only 3D. There was one cinema that showed it in 2D that was in London. <laughs> um, okay, on uh, Friday the 27th at 11.35pm on BBC2, there's Moon, Duncan Jones... Um, great movie with Sam Rockwell, which is, I mean, that's a great little. I, I mean, was it, was it a British film as well, or was it American? American funded, maybe. It, it's yeah, it's it's that weird one. It is a British movie because of Sam Rockwell and Duncan Jones. Dun, well, Duncan Jones is yeah, it, it is a British centric film. Yeah, um, and my other movie that I've sort of noted this week is Saturday, twenty eighth of November, at nine o'clock, um, on Film Four again, The Iceman purely because it's, it's it's like those other films where it's a very average film but it's got a really really central performance by Michael Shannon that really is good shines in it um, but one out of those films those choices there well it's going to be 71 then it's cause, because of the fact of that it's a film that as much as Dread needs to be seen it's been shown several times people I think if they were going to see it they've seen it now 71 on the other hand it's got its premiere it is a small film which I don't think got enough attention as it deserved and it's worth seeing just because of the fact that even the subject is still quite relevant I think today yeah um, so I had 71 as well down on my list and I also had um, I also had Dread as well because that, that's a really good double bill yeah uh, my other choice because I have got a third one because I probably knew that you were going for that <laughs> one so I will make this my TV movie of the week because you made 71 your TV movie well, we can have the same one no, I did, I did, I'll let you have um, 71 as your TV movie of the week and then at least gives people options because my uh, choice is on Saturday the 28th at 10 past 11 on film 4 nothing surprising there it's um, America Mary directed by the Soska sisters starring Catherine Isabel Stewart is probably jumping with joy at the moment because uh, he, he's um, he's got 71 British movie Irish British film and America Mary which is the Soska sisters um, brilliantly played by Catherine Isabel, a woman who gets revenge body modification wise. It's really grisly to watch at times. The Suska sisters make an appearance in the film as well as these twisted twins, hence their nickname that they've got. And yeah, it's not for the um, uh, for people who don't have a strong stomach. You really do need a strong stomach to watch it, but highly recommended. Hence why it's on at 10 past 11 at night on Saturday the 28th on Film 4. So that's our selections of the week. Yeah. What it, does mean, your... it does mean as well that we've got a double bill on the Thursday night with 71 and Dread, and then a double bill on the Saturday night with Iceman and American Mary. Yeah. Um, overall, though, what is your movie of the week? Um, it's going to be uh, Inside Out. Completely agree. Inside yeah. Out. Inside Out is easily by a country mile 
movie of the week. Uh, Cinema-wise, The Dressmaker is a really good film, but definitely Inside Out. And that's it for this week's show. Make sure you check out the website. The new UK box office top 10 is now up on there on mondaymovieshow.co.uk. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash mondaymovieshow, Twitter at mondaymovieshow, I'm at Cryptic Tadpole, Andrew's at EHDVD. Uh, following the nerd.com, check out their website. The box office top 10 goes up on there as well. Um, you can also, Stuart, who's been in the live chat, he is from page two screen on Twitter, and his website is exactly that from page two screen.com. He does multiple podcasts, um, and so check out the stuff that he actually does. We will be back Monday or Tuesday next week, hopefully Monday, um, with quite a few uh, new releases, including one film which you've already seen. It's uh, Steven Spielberg's latest film, Bridge of Spies, starring Tom Hanks. I really want to see this movie. I probably will go to see this film because a movie that I was supposed to go and see for next week's show, I can't go and see it. So I will actually substitute it for this movie. So here's a clip for Bridge of Spies yeah. and we'll catch you next week. I was going to say actually before this, because I've seen it, I genuinely believe this will get at least three Oscar nods, two of them for Tom Hanks and Mark Rylance's performances. Yeah, but we'll leave that until next week's yeah. show. So until next week, goodbye. Bye -bye. Okay, here's the thing. The Soviet spy they caught, we want you to defend him. Here's the indictment. Well, I'm not sure I want to pick that up. The accused doesn't know any lawyers. The federal court tossed it into our lap. The bar committee took a vote. You're the unanimous choice. It was important to us, it's important to our country, Jim, that this man is seen as getting a fair shake. American justice will be on trial. Well, of course, when you put it that way, it's an honor to be asked, but do you? Lynn, I'm an insurance lawyer. I haven't done criminal work in years. It's like riding a bike, isn't it? You distinguish yourself at Nuremberg. I was on the prosecution team. Not the point. You're no stranger to criminal law. Jim, look at the situation. The man is publicly reviled. And I will be, too. Yes, in more ignorant quarters. But that's exactly why this has to be done, and capably done. It can't look like our justice system tosses people on the ash heap.